By way of preface, I shall inform the reader that my intention is to give a succinct account of some of my adventures, dangers, and sufferings during my several campaigns in the Revolutionary Army. Should the reader chance to ask himself this question, how could any man of common sense ever spend his precious time in writing such a rhapsody of nonsense, I would inform him that every private soldier in an army thinks his particular services as essential as the services of the most influential general. And why not? What could officers do without such men? Nothing at all. Alexander could never have conquered the world without private soldiers. I remember the stir in the country occasioned by the Stamp Act, but I was so young that I did not understand the meaning of it. I likewise remember the disturbances that followed the repeal of the Stamp Act, until the destruction of the tea at Boston and elsewhere. I was then 13 or 14 years old, and began to understand something of the works going on. I used about this time to inquire a great deal about the French War, as it was called, which had not been long ended. My grandsire would talk to me then while working in the fields. I thought, then, nothing should induce me to get caught up in the toils of an army. I am well, so I'll keep, was my motto then, and it would have been well for me if I had retained it. Time passed smoothly on with me till the year 1774 arrived. The smell of war began to be pretty strong, but I was determined to have no hand in it. What? Venture my carcass where bullets fly? That will never do for me. During the winter of 1775-76, to 76, by hearing the conversation and disputes of the good old farmer politicians of the times, I collected pretty correct ideas of the contest between this country and the mother country, as it was then called. I thought I was as warm a patriot as the best of them. The war was waged, we had joined issue, and it would not do to put the hand to the plow and look back. I felt more anxious than ever, if possible, to be called a defender of my country. Well, enlisting orders were out. I used frequently to go to the rendezvous, where I saw many of my young associates enlist, had repeated banterings to engage with them, but still when it came to case in hand, I had my misgivings. If I once undertake, thought I, I must stick to it. There would be no receding. So, seating myself at the table, enlisting orders were immediately presented to me. I took up the pen, loaded it with the fatal charge, made several mimic imitations of writing my name, but took especial care not to touch the paper with the pen, until an unlucky white who was leaning over my shoulder gave my hand a stroke, which caused the pen to make a woeful scratch on the paper. Oh, he has enlisted, said he. He has made his mark, he is fast enough now. Well, thought I, I may as well go through the business now as not. So I wrote my name fairly upon the indentures. And now, I was a soldier. In name at least, if not in practice. This video is sponsored by Magellan TV, the documentary streaming service. So, quick update from Coco. She's now in charge of finding all the sources for Voices of the Past. Unfortunately, she speaks Spanish and these are English translations. And she's a cat. So if you guys have any suggestions, please leave a comment. And a great place to be inspired is Magellan TV. And our recommendation this week is Yellowstone, one of the many new documentaries recently added to the service. Partnered with America from Above, these two documentaries really give you a sense of the vastness and beauty of American nature. Magellan is essentially a Netflix for documentaries, with the largest range of history stuff anywhere, and over 3,000 documentaries, with new ones being added all the time. So, click on the link in the description for an exclusive month-long free trial for Voices of the Past viewers. Thanks. I had obtained my heart's desire. It was now my business to prove myself equal to my profession. Well, to be short, I went with several others of the company on board a sloop bound to New York. Had a pleasant, though protracted passage, passed through the strait called Hellgate, arrived at New York, marched up into the city and joined the rest of the regiment. Soon after my arrival in New York, a 44-gun ship, the Phoenix, 
and a small frigate, the Rose, I think, came down the North or Hudson River and passed the city in fine style, amidst a cannonade from all our fortifications in and near the city. I went into what was then called the Grand Battery, where I had a complete view of the whole affair. Here, I first heard the muttering of a cannon shot, but they did not disturb my feelings so much as I apprehended they would before I heard them. I rather thought the sound was musical, or at least grand. I heard enough of them afterwards to form what ideas I pleased of them. I remained in New York two or three months, when, sometime in the latter part of the month of August, the regiment was ordered to Long Island, the British having landed in force there. Although this was not unexpected to me, yet it gave me a rather disagreeable feeling, as I was pretty well assured I should have to snuff a little gunpowder. However, I kept my cogitations to myself, went to my quarters, packed up my clothes, and got myself in readiness for the expedition as soon as possible. I then went to the top of the house, where I had a full view of that part of the island. I distinctly saw the smoke of the field artillery. The horrors of battle had presented themselves to my mind in all their hideousness. I must come to it now, thought I. Well, I will endeavor to do my duty, as well as I am able. We quickly embarked on board the boats. As each boat started, three cheers were given by those on board, which was returned by the numerous spectators who thronged to the wharves, although it was, with most of them, perhaps nothing more than ceremony. We soon landed at Brooklyn, upon the island, and marched up the ascent from the ferry to the plain. We now began to meet with wounded men, another side I was unacquainted with, some with broken arms, some with broken legs, and some with broken heads. The sight of those uh, a little daunted me and made me think of home, but the sight and thought vanished together. We pressed forward towards a creek where a large party of Americans and British were engaged. By the time we arrived, the enemy had driven our men into the creek, where such as could swim got across. Those that could not swim and could not procure anything to buoy them up, sunk. Our regiment then lay on the ground, we then occupied the following night. The next day in the afternoon we had a considerable tight scratch, with about an equal number of the British, which began unexpectedly. A few of our men went over the creek upon business that usually employed us, that is, in search of something to eat. There was a field of Indian corn at a short distance from the creek. The men purposed to get some of the corn, or anything that was eatable. When they got up with the haycocks, they were fired upon by an equal number of the British from the cornfield. Our people took to the hay, and the others to the fence, where they exchanged a number of shots at each other, neither side inclining to give back. A number, say forty or fifty more of our men, went over and drove the British from the fence. They were by this time reinforced in their turn and drove us back. The two parties kept us alternately reinforcing until we had most of our regiment in the action. The English were soon routed from the place, but we dared not to follow them, for fear of falling into some snare, as the whole British army was in the vicinity of us. I do not recollect that we had anyone killed outright, but we had several severely wounded, and some, I believe, mortally. I never wished to do anyone an injury through malice in my life, nor did I do anyone an intentional injury when I was in the army unless it was when sheer necessity drove me to it. And my conscience bears me witness that innumerable times I have suffered, rather than take from anyone what belonged of right to them, even to satisfy the cravings of nature. And now was coming on the famous Kipps Bay affair, which has been criticized so much by the historians of the revolution. I was there, and will give a true statement of all that I saw during that day. It was on a Sabbath morning, the day in which the British were always employed about their devilry, if possible. I had stepped into an old warehouse which stood close to me and sat down upon a stool. The floor was strewn with papers which had in some former period been used in the concerns of the house. I was very demurely perusing these papers when all of a sudden there came such a pearl of thunder from the British shipping that I thought my head would go with the sound. I made a frog's leap for the ditch and lay as still as I possibly could and began to consider which part of my carcass was to go first. 
In retreating, I had to cross a level clear spot of ground, 40 or 50 rods wide, exposed to the whole of the enemy's fire, and they gave it to us in prime order. The grape shot flew merrily, which served to quicken our motions. When I had gotten a little out of the reach of their combustibles, I found myself in company with one who was a neighbor of mine when at home. We went into a house by the highway in which were two women and some small children. We asked the woman if they had any spirits in the house. They placed a case bottle of rum upon the table and bid us to help ourselves. We each of us drank a glass and, bidding them goodbye, betook ourselves to the highway again. We had not been long on this road before we saw another party just ahead of us whom we knew to be Americans. Just as we overtook these, we were fired upon by a party of British from a cornfield, and all was immediately in confusion again. I believe the enemy's party was small, but our people were all militia, and the demons of fear and disorder seemed to take full possession of all and everything on that day. We had to advance slowly, for my comrade, having been sometime unwell, was now so overcome by heat, hunger and fatigue that he became suddenly violently sick. I took his musket and endeavored to encourage him on. He was, as I before observed, a nigh neighbor of mine when at home, and I was loath to leave him behind, although I was anxious to find the main part of the regiment. We had proceeded but a short distance, however, before we found our retreat cut off by a party of the enemy, stretched across the island. I immediately quitted the roads and went into the fields, where there happened to be a small spot of boggy land, covered with low bushes and weeds. Into these I ran, and squatting down, concealed myself from their sight. Several of the British came so near to me that I could see the buttons on their clothes. They, however, soon withdrew and left the coast clear for me again. I then came out of my convert and went on, but what had become of my sick comrade or the rest of my companions, I knew not. I still kept the sick man's musket. I was unwilling to leave it, for it was his own property. I had, indeed, enough to do to take care of my own concerns. It was exceeding hot weather, and I was faint, having slept very little on the preceding night. Nor had I eaten a mouthful of victuals for more than twenty-four hours. I waddled on as well and as fast as I could, and soon came up with a number of men at a small brook, where they had stopped to drink and rest themselves a few moments. Just as I arrived, a man had laid down to drink at the brook, and as he did not rise very soon, one of the company observed that he would kill himself with drinking. Upon which, another, touching him without his appearing to notice it, said that he had already killed himself, which was the case. I passed across the corner of one field and threw a gap in a cross fence into another, and here I found a number of men resting under the trees. Almost the first I saw was my sick friend. I was exceeding glad to find him, for I had but little hope of ever seeing him again. He was sitting near the fence with his head between his knees. I tapped him upon the shoulder and asked him to get up and go with me. No, said he, I must die here. I endeavored to argue the case with him, but all to no purpose, he insisted upon dying there. I told him he should not die there nor anywhere else that day if I could help it, and at length, with more persuasion and some force, I succeeded in getting him up on his feet again and moving on. There happened at this time to be a considerable shower of rain, which wet us through to the skin, being very thinly clad. We, however, continued to move forward, although more slowly. After proceeding about half a mile, we came to a place where our people had begun to make a stand. I and my comrades were stopped here, a sentinel being placed in the road to prevent our going any further. I remonstrated with the officer who detained us, but I told him I had a sick man with me who was wet and would die if exposed all night to the damp cold air, hoping by this to move his compassion, but it would not do. Well, said he, if he dies, the country will be rid of one who can do it no good. It was now almost sundown, and the air quite chilly after the shower. I was really afraid my sick man would die. There came to the sentinel, I suppose, an old acquaintance of his, with a canteen containing some sort of spirits. After drinking himself, he gave it to the sentinel, who took a large pull upon it. They then fell into conversation. I kept my eyes upon them, and when I saw a chance of getting from them, I gave my companions a wink, and we passed by the sentinel, without him noticing us at all. We proceeded, but had not gone far, when we came up with the regiment resting themselves upon the cold ground after the fatigues of the day. 
Our company all appeared to rejoice to see us, thinking we were killed or prisoners. I was sincerely glad to see them, for I was once more among friends. We were the last who came up. All the others who were missing were either killed or taken prisoners. And here ends the Kipps Bay affair, which caused at the time and has since caused much ink shed. Anecdotes, jests, imprecations, and sarcasms have been multiplied, and even the grave writers of the revolution have said and written more about it than it deserved. I could make some observations, but it is beyond my province. I had learned something of a soldier's life, enough, I thought, to keep me at home for the future. Indeed, I was then fully determined to rest easy with the knowledge I had acquired in the affairs of the army. But the reader will find, if he has patience to follow me a little longer in my details, that the ease of a winter spent at home caused me to alter my mind. <laughs>